Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Alaska Sea Life Center. My name is Darren. I am here with Dr. Amy Bishop, one of our scientists here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. So uh, the Alaska Sea Life Center, if you're not familiar with us, we are a public education facility. We have these great exhibits for folks to come and enjoy and learn about Alaska's ocean ecosystems. But we also generate a lot of science, uh, scientific information about Alaska's oceans. And so Amy here is one of the folks that helps us to understand what's going on out there in the ocean ecosystems around Alaska. And today, with Amy, we are going to be exploring ethograms. So I'm going to let Dr. Amy take it away and tell us what is an ethogram and what is this all about? All right, thank you, Darren. Uh, like Darren said, I'm a scientist here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. And one of the areas that I'm most interested in researching is animal behavior. Now, you might be thinking of animal behavior like a Jane Goodall documentary that you saw at some point in your life or Jacques Cousteau storming out across the oceans and trying to observe animals in their environment. And you'd be right. That's the study of animal behavior. Understanding what animals are doing at different parts of their day, understanding what areas are important to them, understanding how they move and interact with their environment and with each other can be really critical for conservation and management. So a couple examples of how the Sea Life Center has used animal behavior to contribute to conservation and management of Alaska's marine ecosystems are our most long running, our oldest research project is the Chiswell Monitoring Program. That program has been studying the behaviors of the endangered stellar sea lion since the late 1990s. And by understanding the behaviors that female stellar sea lions do during their breeding season, how they're giving birth, how many, <laughs> the birds are quite talkative, uh, how they're giving birth, how many pups they're having, what behaviors they're having with each other, with the males on these rookeries, helps us understand a little bit about why that population may have declined as severely as it did in the 1970s, and also how it might respond to current threats. The Gulf of Alaska has been experiencing these marine heat waves in the last couple years. So by understanding their behaviors, we can start to identify when things aren't quite normal, when they're starting to behave differently. And that gives us a warning indication that something's not OK in the ecosystem. For animals that are a little harder to observe, like fish or sharks, we actually can use satellite tags or different types of electronic monitoring devices to observe the animals when they're actually underwater. And that's one of the projects that I work on, is studying the elusive Pacific sleeper shark. And so by putting tags on those animals, we know what habitats they're using, what temperatures they prefer, how they dive, and how they move about under the water which is all really important because, again, they're a top predator in these marine ecosystems. And so if something happens to them or if something happens to other parts of the ecosystems, understanding their behavior helps us understand how all those pieces fit together. So as Darren said, I called this little session exploring ethograms, and that's probably a new word for most people. But an ethogram, at its very simplest, is a list of behaviors. So whenever you start studying an animal, it's really important to understand what's normal for that animal. What behaviors does it do? So if we take these lovely birds that we have here in our aviary, we're going to start by just taking a couple minutes and watching what they do and make a list of all their behaviors. So you can follow along at home if you've got a pen and a paper. You can watch all these birds we have out here. It doesn't matter which bird you pick for now, what species. Just have a look and kind of see what behaviors they're doing. Some of them, you'll notice, are resting. They've got their head tucked under their wing, and they're taking a little afternoon siesta. Others might be swimming about. Some are being quite noisy. <laughs> and are vocalizing. <laughs> Um, let's see, a couple others are giving themselves a little bath, so they're preening, preening or bathing. Let's see, one's flying overhead, I don't know if you see that kitty wake swooping in and out of the screen, but we've got some flying. Everybody quieted back down, <laughs> spoke too soon. So now that you've had a chance to kind of look at all the birds, you might say, OK, well, we really only watch them there for probably 30 seconds, maybe a minute. 
And to really understand an animal, you really would have to take a much longer time to get a full list of all of the behaviors that they may do. For example, these birds, we know they lay eggs and they raise chicks, but it's not the right time of the year. So those aren't behaviors that we observed during that brief little window of us watching them. It might also be that at some point in their day, they have to eat because <laughs> um, it's not a feeding time here at the Sea Life Center. We didn't observe that behavior either. So that's something important to remember when we're making these ethograms is that to really know all the behaviors of an animal, you have to really take the time to get to know them. So for an example, for my PhD research, I was in England and I was studying gray seals. I actually sat in a wooden box on the beach for six weeks of the year watching those seals in November, which was quite cold, <laughs> um, and I really got to know them. I got to understand what types of behaviors they did. And over time, that list of behaviors really was more developed. And then I could ask different types of questions which is where we're going to kind of go for the next part of this. You're going to get to kind of step into the role of a scientist and think about what types of scientific questions we can answer with behaviors. So, for example, I said for the gray seals, I was watching them from my box and I noticed that they were doing a weird behavior where they were essentially doing a push up and then slapping themselves back onto the ground. And two males would do that at each other. And so that got us thinking, what's the purpose of that behavior? Are they trying to communicate? How are they trying to communicate? Those are all questions that then we were able to develop hypotheses and test through the scientific method. Sometimes though, the most important questions you can ask are those baseline questions. You need to understand what is normal for an animal to understand when there might be impacts or changes to their behaviors. And that could be if there was a change in their environment, how is that impacting them? How is climate change impacting them? How are human activities potentially impacting animals? For example, at the Sea Life Center, we were studying Stellar's eiders, and not a lot was known about their behaviors either. So every day there was a whole list of behaviors that our researchers would sit and keep track of what they were doing so that we would know about their health, when they were exhibiting abnormal behaviors, and that would help us really understand what was going on with these animals in our care as well as in the wild. So there's two ways that we can record animal behavior when we're doing a scientific study. The first one is that you can look at the duration of behaviors, how long an animal spends doing a specific behavior, and then the sequence of behaviors of do they do one always before the next before the next. The second way that you can do that is by taking more of a scan sample is what we call it. So you're just kind of trying to get a snapshot picture of what animals do and then break that down to figure out the question of what behavior do animals spend most of their time doing. So that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to set my watch for a couple minutes. And the important thing with a scan sample is that you take a recording of a behavior from one animal and you do it at a set frequency. So for this, I'm going to pick that common mur right there on the rock. That's the bird I'm gonna watch. I encourage you to pick any bird that you like. We've got puffins here. We've got eiders. The puffins don't look too impressive yet. They're in their molt, but they will have their beautiful breeding plumage soon. Um, we've got a couple of other uh, murs and guillemots floating around that might come in and out of view. So pick one bird, and for the next couple minutes, you're going to watch it. And every 10 minutes, I'm going to say go, or sorry, every 10 seconds, I'm going to say go. And you put a little tally on your ethogram of what the bird was doing right when I said go. All right? Melissa's going to move the camera for us. And we're going to start. Ten seconds feels like a long time when you're waiting for a bird. Go! 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 Go. 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 One minute down, one to go. Go.
Oh, you got a lot more birds in view now. Go. 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 Hope you picked a good bird. Mine's been pretty sleepy. Go. And last one, here it comes. And go. All right, so this was the ethogram that I made for my common mer. When I was watching it before, you can see that I had noticed that there were birds that were resting, swimming. We had those kitty wakes giving us a little chatter. Uh, some of the birds were preening, which is cleaning their feathers or bathing. Um, we had a couple flying. And alert is a great behavior to observe for animals because it means that they're kind of scanning their environment. They're checking it out. They're not sure what's going on. Um, so as you can see in the two minutes that I watched my mer, it spent almost all of its time resting and just a very little bit of time alert. So it picked its head up, looked around a little bit, and then went back to resting. This information might not seem very exciting. When you watch Nat Geo programs, you're watching the animals chase down gazelles and are, they're doing crazy behaviors and they're jumping out of the water and they're flying around chasing fish and doing all the exciting, cool behaviors that animals do sometimes. <laughs> most animals do spend most of their time resting. For animals, it's really energetically costly to go and have to chase down your food and forage and take care of yourself in the wild. So it makes sense that to make up for that, they have to spend a good amount of their time resting and kind of recuperating and, and saving some of that energy. And so while this doesn't seem like a very important finding, it actually can be really important for conservation and management. Because if we think back to what we were talking about, about disturbances or changes, think about a seal that uses ice. Let's say that it does spend a lot of its time resting. Well, what happens when a lot more ships have to drive past there because the shipping lanes got changed? Maybe it's going to spend more time alert. That's more energy spent and less time resting. Similarly, if there's less ice because of climate change, that seal might have to spend more time in the water, swimming around, or have to travel farther to get to somewhere where it can rest. Again, that's an energetic cost that could have negative implications for the animal or for the population or even the ecosystem. So hopefully this gave you a great idea of just the very easy way that scientists can study animal behaviors and we can learn something about them that's important for conservation and management. Now the best part is, because everybody's pretty much stuck inside, you can continue doing this from your own home. If you have a bird feeder in your backyard, you can watch those birds make an ethogram and see what your birds do. See which birds come to the feeders. Granted, if they're at a bird feeder, they're probably gonna spend a whole lot of their time in a feeding behavior. So you can also do this in the park, with your pet, with your little brother. The sky's the limit. You can be a, somebody who studies animal behavior right from your own home. And if you're interested in following more about some of the research projects that the Sea Life Center does, we talked about a couple today. But if you're interested in any others, please feel free to follow our science blog. It can be found on our website uh, under the science tab and it should be showing on your screen right now. We try to post on there once a week about different projects that the Sea Life Center is doing, the research that we're doing to help understand and promote stewardship of Alaska's marine ecosystems. So thanks for joining us today. Darren's got a little send off. All right, that was awesome. Uh, Amy, I saw one of the MERS that I was watching mm. um, definitely doing a little bit of courtship, but it ah. was maybe once every 30 seconds. So I could see yes. easily missing something that was yes. fabulously interesting, but you have to be yes. objective and unbiased, right, when you're yep. doing this kind of scientific work. So it's a real challenge, yep. but it seems like the challenge of a scientist is to make uh, the data defensible. So yes. you have to be able to just collect it in a way that someone else could have done the exact same thing. Exactly. And the other important thing is that when you are trying to set up something like a scan sample, like you said, that 
time frame that I chose, I kind of chose randomly. Figured 10 seconds was good for everybody's attention spans. But if you know your animal or you know something about it, or if you have a very specific question, you can tailor that so that you might be able to capture more of those very short behaviors that you might not see at a different interval. Uh -huh. Stage two of the funding of yes. <laughs> <laughs> the research project, I assume. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks again to Dr. Amy Bishop uh, for helping us understand animal behavior through ethograms and uh, continue to follow us on Facebook Live as well as our YouTube channel here and give us a thumbs up. Join us for programs every day as we continue to deliver more of these and check out the education corner on our YouTube channel. That's where we're storing all of these videos uh, on a playlist for the future. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye.